teacher in Israel? This wasn't just a, a junior Pharisee making his way up the ranks. This was, a, this was one of the chief Pharisees. And we've heard already, we've read this morning, we've been looking through Mark, and we've seen Jesus' encounters with the, with the scribes and the, and, the, and the lawyers and the Pharisees, and it never goes well. And we read in Matthew those, those very pointed, terse, Words, that language. Jesus does not say to the woman at the well whom we're going to see in John 4. He doesn't say to her, you're, you're like a whitewashed tomb. He saves that for the religious elite. But he treats Nicodemus differently. And that's what I want you to see tonight. You see, Nicodemus doesn't come declaring. He comes inquiring. Now we recognize the time of night he came. He, he, he did not encounter him in the day. And commentators have kind of bounced around why. And I think a plausible explanation is he didn't want to be seen with him at day. He comes to him at night. But he's seen something. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray for one another and for ourselves that people who encounter us, people who've heard about us, will have seen something. They will have heard something. There's, he talks about the signs that Jesus is doing. Now, we're just looking at John, but if you lay out, I challenge you to do this. Get a good harmony of the Gospels. Now, Lorraine Bettner, that's a man's name, by the way. Lorraine Bettner, who's passed away now, was a great Reformed scholar. He wrote the book, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination. It's, there's nothing any better on the subject. But he had a harmony of the Gospels. If not that, the, the, the historic Baptist A.T. Robertson wrote a, a great harmony of the Gospels. And you read through the four Gospel accounts and you're kind of dealing with them chronologically as they happen in the life of Jesus. And so if you were reading that, you would know other miracles had taken place. We only read about the w miracle at, at the wedding in Cana in John's Gospel. Nicodemus talks about signs. He, he's either seen some or he's heard about them. So he comes to Jesus at night. And Jesus, it's fascinating when you look at how Jesus deals with him. He doesn't even initially let Nicodemus ask anything. Nicodemus makes an observation and look at it. Let's just go back through the text. Verse 2, he comes, he says, Rabbi, we know... So it's not just him, and we don't know who the others are, but we do know at his, at his death when he needs to be taken down from the cross that, that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, a partner of Nicodemus's, that they come requesting the body of Jesus. We know that you are a teacher come from God. Now, what's he saying there? He's not calling him Messiah, but he, he's willing to grant that he has a prophetic status, that God sent the prophets to they would recognize that. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We talked last week, week before last a little bit, about power, about how this culture is not impressed with our fine arguments. And if you haven't, if you're reading newspapers, magazines, Facebook, if you're reading social media, you should know not only are people not impressed with our arguments, they detest our arguments. We are bigots to them. We are haters to them. David Platt. Saturday night, I think. Friday night or Saturday night. Did another uh, episode of Secret Church. So six, we, were, we did it here one year. Six years, <laughs> six hours of teaching. teaching. We was teaching on, on hell and eternal punishment. And boy, the things people had to say about him. About how narrow-minded. What kind of a God do you serve? That a God would, would send people who've never heard, he would send them to hell? What kind of love is that? I mean, just the vitriol that came out in print. And this is where we live. It's always been there, but it is so prevailing now. But power... We need to pray that the power would fall upon us. 
I pray that for you, that God would, His power would fall upon you, the people you encounter would be so gripped and say to you and to me, we don't understand everything, but we, we know you have a connection with God, whoever God is, because we've never seen anything like it. And folks, it may, be, it may be the power of loving in the face of incredible ridicule, of holding our ground. Do you realize increasingly speaking the truth in love uh, is a challenge in this culture? You know, when I was growing up, you could speak the truth in love to somebody who had no church affiliation and they would in all likelihood thank you for it. Not now. And yet that's where we stand. The power of loving against all odds. The power of loving the very unloving. The power of loving those who are our enemies, sworn enemies. But power, we need to pray that because Nicodemus is impressed with this. Now, he makes this declaration. Jesus didn't even say thank you. He doesn't say, well, I'm glad you observed that. That's a, that's a good observation, Nicodemus. What he basically says to him is, Nicodemus, you haven't seen what you need to see. Look at what he says. Truly, truly. And by the way, in the Greek, those words are amen, amen. If I put them up on the, on the screen for you, you would see the word amen in it. That's what the word amen means. True. May it be so. Let it be done. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this idea of being born again, born from above, they kind of become synonymous. But Nicodemus picks up on this notion of another birth. He's an older man, and in his culture, the older men were to be regarded. Remember the, the, the teaching about the prophet, if, the, the hoary-headed fellow, the, the white-haired person. Uh, I, hope it, I hope it also pertains to the balding. You know, that would be good if we, if we can get in on that. But... Uh, that was, you were revered by your age. What Nicodemus hears Jesus saying is you need to become young. You need to become a babe. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I, th I think at this point Nicodemus is basically kind of toying with Jesus. I don't believe that he thinks Jesus is talking about a, a reincarnation. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter. Now, notice the shift here. In verse 3, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He'll be blind to it. Here he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's, more, it's, it's one thing not to see and blindly grasp your way, but to say no entrance to someone who has spent his adult life teaching people how to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says this, and, and commentators again will differ about this, but I think, I think the context of this makes it pretty plain. If you just let it speak on its own. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Some say, well, born of the flesh, uh, there's, that's, is, that, is that water baptism? Is that, is that the water at birth and then the spiritual? Is, I don't think it's that complicated. Because when you drop down and he uses the second image, we're going to look at this in a minute. He ends at verse 8, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We've talked in here before, when you read the book of the Revelation, it talks about a second death. And what you learn when you put these teachings on, on life and birth and death together is that everyone who gets an opportunity to live in this world has been born once, right? Right? Everyone here is born. We have, if we don't have any other thing in common, we've got that in common. We were all born. Born once. But that's not enough for any of us to spend eternity with God. You've got to be born twice. We're going to look at that. Well, if the Lord Jesus Christ tarries, then what happens to every one of us here? 
we will all die once. Uh, Hebrews 9, it's appointed to us once to die, and after that the judgment. And that first death will be our last death, follow me with, if we've been born twice. But if we've only been born once, that's the physical birth, and not born twice, the spiritual birth, then being born once and dying means we'll die twice. We'll have a second death, and that's, that's eternal separation from God in judgment. That's what the book of Revelation, they will not taste the second death, that's what it's talking about there. And Jesus plainly says here, it seems to me, being physically born is just that, being physically born. Now, you and I read that and so, so what would Nicodemus have heard there? What would he have heard? Remember the protest in John chapter 8 when the, when the Jews said, we are, we are Abraham's children. We're not born of fornication. We're not, there's no question about our heritage, our lineage. We are Jews. Let's, let's paraphrase. A person being, being born a Jew has simply been born. That's what Nicodemus is hearing. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now Nicodemus has just, I think, been put on his heels. He's come to compliment Jesus and been probably to probe to find out more about him. Jesus is discerning and finds out where he is and is lovingly pointing to him his deepest need. Now you and I do not have that kind of discernment. We don't see in the people's thoughts. Jesus did. What we would do to learn from this passage is to ask questions. So, Jesus, what do you think about him? That's a fair question to ask anyone. Now, there was a day, again, in this, in this culture, I'm afraid years, decades ago now, where you ask someone what they thought about Jesus, and they would say, he was the son of God, or a good man, or you won't get that pat answer now if you talk to certain people. And they'll tell them what, what they'll say about him. Because the mindset of this current generation is that Jesus led a misogynistic movement, and by misogynistic I mean a, a, dom a man-dominant, woman-hating movement. Now all you got to do is read the scriptures and you see this, this misogynistic God sending this misogynistic son and it's just a male-dominated, male-oriented, women, second-class citizens. That's what you're going to hear today. But for Nicodemus, Jesus is probing him. We need, we need to probe people by learning to ask questions. Ask, we talked about this before, ask and listen. I'm going to challenge you this week. Karen was with someone this past week and we were talking about it and she said... Uh, I don't remember who it was really, but she said, you know, she said, I simply asked a question and I didn't have to say another thing. This person who hardly knew her opened her soul, just bore her soul to her. Isn't that right? And I'm telling you folks, if we're not asking questions, we're missing opportunity. You've seen that, haven't you, Josh? You've encountered some people and just, but listen, I mean, don't just, don't check out when they start talking and thinking about, what, what was I going to, I want to wake up for supper. No, no. Listen, be a good listener. Hear what they're saying. Because they're going to tell you where they are. They're going to tell you what bothers them. They're going to tell you what, what they think they need, and you're going to hear what their deepest need is. And that's our, that's our way of following Jesus' example here. So he probes him now. He puts this second image in front of him. The wind blows. He says, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again or born from above. The wind blows where it wishes. Now here's a phenomenon that Nicodemus has to acknowledge and cannot deny. He dare not deny because the reality is so obvious. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. True. It's like talking to somebody today and they say, well, I just, there's just so much I don't understand about the Bible. I don't understand about Christianity. I don't, and I just don't I, don't, I don't do anything if I don't understand it. Anybody ever told you anything quite like that? I've, I've heard that before. So I've, I've been known to ask, you have a car? Yeah. Do you understand the nature of combustible engines so that you could break one down and put it back together? 
to drive your car? Well, no, of course I don't. I'm not a mechanic. Do you put the key in the ignition and turn it on? Yeah. I would just make an observation that it's not everything that you have to understand in order to engage. Do you understand electricity? You know, John Pendleton understands electricity. I would kill myself working around my house. He just, he, he gets into stuff and, and I'm just, I don't understand. But I don't sit in the dark because I don't understand electricity. I flip the switch and look for light. People, we need to help people see that what they say often is a defense. It's not what they really mean and they don't even practice it really. So Jesus makes this obvious assertion about wind. It moves where it will. Now, you and I wouldn't catch this necessarily, but if we were reading in the Greek, here's what he would have said. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the pneuma is pneuma. That the P-N-E-U-M-A, we get pneumonia from it. A disease of the, of the wind capacity. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit, pneuma, is spirit. Verse 8, the pneuma blows where we see the word pneuma also means wind. So he's used the same word here. So play on words. Nicodemus knows what he's saying here in, in what is our verse 8, that it, it moves where it will. You can't, you can't harness wind. I've, I've told you this before, but I'll never forget when Conrad and Bayway was preaching in the church back in Shreveport when I was pastoring there. And, and he, he, he has this way of talking about word pictures, drawing out pictures. He was talking about Americans. He said, you, you Americans have all this technology and you, you can study this and you're able to predict this. You can predict the weather. You can predict storms. You, you can predict a, a hurricane forming. You can predict the path of the hurricane. And going. He, said, and he said, with all that technology, in the face of an approaching hurricane, all you can do is give it a name. Right? Because why? Because the wind blows where it will. You can't say, well, we need that hurricane to go a little farther east of Florida. Just go out to the Atlantic. No, you can't do that. It's going to go where it's going to go. So there's this, this, this picture he gives him. The sovereign, unmitigated, unquestioned move of the wind. You hear it sound. That's, that's how you know there is wind. But you don't know where it's coming from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, Nicodemus, I'm talking to you about a mystery. Because your problem, Nicodemus, is not what you think you know. Your problem is what you don't know. And that's, by the way, folks, that's the problem with people we encounter. It's what they don't know. In fact, it was our problem. I knew about Jesus years before I knew Jesus. Well now, and here he asks this question, verse 9. How can these things be? And at this point, he asks this question to kind of put the brakes on. How? But notice Jesus' answer. Are you the teacher? Definite article in the original. Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? And what he's talking about there, you don't, you don't understand the reality of the sovereign movement of wind? If you're perplexed about that, and he's, and by the way, who isn't when they contemplate, the, the point he's making is you ought to recognize you don't understand that and recognize there's the possibility of some other things you don't understand. Verse 11, truly, truly, a good, a good uh, Texan, Texas paraphrase for that is, listen up, pay attention. I say to you, we speak, who's we? He is speaking of, of, his, of the mystery of his relationship with the Godhead. Remember at the, at the forming of the world, God Elohim, the creator, says, let us make man in our image. 
And you have to, if you're an honest student, you stop and say, who is us? Well, it's not the angels. We weren't made in the angels. In fact, the scripture says we were made a little lower than the angels while we live on this earth, but we're going to be exalted above them. Let us. And so Jesus says, we speak of what we know. Nicodemus has said, we know that you're a man come from God, for people can't do the things you do, the signs you, lest God be with him. Jesus uses that plural first person to speak of the Godhead. We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Now, if Nicodemus is alert here, he's, he's thinking, who's our? Whose testimony do you say I'm rejecting? Because what Jesus is saying, and we know this, reading into this, we know that he's saying, you're not only rejecting my testimony. You, you've come to me and acknowledged some things about me, but you, you, on the face of it, when all is said and done, you reject my testimony. When someone tells you that Jesus, I think Jesus is a good man, but I don't think he's the son of God. I don't think he's the only savior. They don't believe he's a good man. Because he claimed those things for himself. And if I got up here and said to you, I just, I know I've been with you ten and a half years, but I think it's time you know this. I'm the Son of God. You might say, well, you know, Brother Bill's an okay guy, but he's not the Son of God. Well, no, he, if he's not the Son of God, then he's a liar. It's just like I think it was Josh McDowell said, when a person makes that claim, he is either that, he is Lord, or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. It's only options. Nicodemus is willing to acknowledge Jesus at some prophetic level, but Jesus is not taking the flattery. We speak what we know. We bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things about, about the wind, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And he, just, he gives this description in the next few verses that, that the Pharisees taught that only God and sometimes his angels represented him but only God could ascend and descend from heaven. Listen to what he says. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the Son of Man. I want to ask you a question. At this point in John's gospel, when did Jesus ascend into heaven? He says here that no one has ascended into heaven except the, except the Son of Man who descended from heaven. Do you know when Jesus ascended into heaven? Are you familiar with the term theophany? It's a, it's a Greek term, it's a com compound word, theos for God, phaneo, face, when God takes a face. Do you remember when the visitors came to Abraham on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah? How many of them were there? Three. How many went on to Sodom and Gomorrah? Two. Who stayed behind? Jesus. Jesus appeared on earth taking a face. Who does Melchizedek worship? Jesus. In fact, who wrote the Ten Commandments? This is something you may not have thought through before. We're told that the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. Tell me when and where God has fingers. We teach our children that God is spirit and has not a body like man. That's a catechism answer. When does God have fingers? When the Son of God takes on form. Now, some of my pastor friends who want to do away with the Ten Commandments, or at least... One of, the, one of the ten. They just almost freak out, but who wrote the Ten Commandments? I believe the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, in a theophonic visitation. Who's Joshua the high priest coming in the clouds? It's Jesus. Jesus has been descending and ascending from the beginning of time. But only once did he come, not as, not as appearing to, to take on flesh, but only once did he come in the flesh, the incarnation, as Bethlehem's babe. 
as he who would grow and show himself to be the Savior. Now, think about that now, what he says to Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, I don't, I don't know how you're going to understand the heavenly things. If, you, if, the, if the wind picture messes you up, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. No, if, you're, if you're a Pharisee, the teacher, what is one of the things you would have been spending a lot of time teaching on? Heaven. It hadn't changed, has it? People writing books about heaven. People even claiming to have been there. Bless their hearts, we need to love them uh, in their confusion. We don't need to support them. Jesus is the expert on it, is what he's telling him. And then he shifts gears in this, this picture. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, Moses would have been familiar with this from the book of Numbers. And you may remember the story. The people had, they had these outbursts of rebellion. One of them was particularly obnoxious. And just as God had miraculously provided manna for them to go gather from the ground every morning except on Sabbath morning when they were to gather two portions the day before because it would rot if they gathered it on, on the Sabbath. The same God who had dropped quail from the skies in, in enough going on to feed a couple of million people. The same God who had a rock follow them around in the wilderness and if they would speak to the rock, water would come out to provide water for them. This God puts an innumerable number of poisonous snakes in the camp of Israel. And they begin to bite. In fact, they're so numerous. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I believe the Genesis edict. There is enmity between me and snakes. A good snake is a dead snake. And if you're not sure, kill it and then find out if it was poisonous or not. Snakes, poisonous snakes, biting the children of Israel. They're, they're dying. And so, so God says to Moses in this episode, go and make a pole and, put a, and form a brazen serpent and put the serpent on the pole. That's fascinating to me because when Moses was on the mountains collecting the Ten Commandments, what were the people doing? Remember? They made a, a brazen bull. Collected their stuff and put it in the cauldron and melted it. And God says, form a brazen snake. Put it on a pole and lift it up in the middle of the camp. And everyone who looks upon it will what? Live. If they're still alive, even though snake bitten, if they look upon it, they will live. Now, if you're a Pharisee, you know that story, but that story has just wrecked what you know about being made right with God. Because God didn't say, I have these people go over the law again and purpose to be law keepers and repent of being law breakers and The whole idea of works goes up in flames in that story. And if you, if you follow what Jesus is doing here, he is just stripping away from Nicodemus. Defense after defense. He says, as that happened, that episode that you know about, you've taught about it, even so the Son of Man, most, uh, Nicodemus knows who the Son of Man is here. This is Jesus' favorite self-designation. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. The picture there being on a pole. That whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Just as they looked and lived. Charles Spurgeon was a teenager sitting. He was trying to get to his grandfather's chapel where his grandfather, a congregational minister, preached. Spurgeon spent a lot of time with his grandfather growing up and one night he was out and he, and he could not make it. The weather was so bad so he ducked into what he called a, a primitive Methodist chapel. 
Well, it was so bad that the Methodist minister had not made it that night. So one of the members got up. Read Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be you saved, all you ends of the earth. He looked over at Spurgeon and said, Young man, you look miserable. Are you saved? Spurgeon had been struggling. This fellow didn't know this. He'd been struggling off and on, back and forth with, Am I saved or am I not? I, I, th I thought I was, but I don't know if I really know the Lord. Back he said, At that moment, all of these things came to him. And the Lord opened his eyes and saved him. Look and live. And you, if you read Spurgeon's works, you'll hear this look and live refrain over and over. Because that's, he said, That night, I simply looked to Jesus and lived. Went home and told his mother. She was very excited. And then when he told her later on he thought he would become a Baptist, she was not excited. Look and live. That's what Jesus is, is saying to this Pharisee, this, the teacher in Israel. For God, Nicodemus, so loved the world. I want you to hear, again, hear this. Put on some Pharisee eyes and Pharisee ears. What would a Pharisee expect a prophet to say? For God loved the Jews. And God is going to show his love to proselyte Jews, those who will leave their pagan Gentile backgrounds and come under proselyte baptism and embrace Judaism. And there's been a lot of debate. If you've read John 3.16 through the years and people commenting on it, there's about the use of the word cosmos for world and all. And it has, it has about seven different meanings in uh, the New Testament. But there is a meaning of cosmos that is Jew and non-Jew. God loved the world. I have some hyper-Calvinist friends who like to read world as the world of believers. And they would say, for God loved believers, because they, they almost choke at the notion that you would talk about the love of God otherwise. Let it say what it says. What it said to Nicodemus. And that's the, that's the key here. How would Nicodemus have heard this? That he gave his only son. Now he hadn't said son of man, now he's only son. But the connection is there. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He has restated verse 15, now not tying himself to the image of the serpent on the pole, not even emphasizing the lifting up, which would be his cross, but now focusing upon the work of God, whom Nicodemus as the teacher in Israel was a stated master of the work of God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. We need to understand that. Because the world's already condemned. Jesus said when he sent the Spirit, he tells us later in John that he would come and convince or convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Convict the world of sin, of the reality of sin. Sin has been in the world. The world's been under condemnation ever since our first parents sinned in the garden and were cast out of the garden because of that. God's Son didn't come to condemn the world, though admittedly His presence, and today His people's presence, speaking the truth in love, condemns and angers so much so that we'll be the ones who have the invectives hurled back at us. But he came not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And again, this word, read world, world, cosmos. He's speaking to, to the Pharisee, the leading Pharisee, the teacher in Israel, that Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles. Nicodemus is a part of this culture. He may not, he may not be as vehement as Caiaphas and some of the others are when we read about them. But he's part of the culture. He, he's in the forest where the trees are that doesn't want anything to do with the Gentiles. 
If he's a good Orthodox Pharisee, then on his way to visit Jesus, had he had the unhappy experience of the shadow of a, of a Gentile being cast over him, he would have turned around and gone back because he would have been, at that point, ceremonially unclean because a Gentile dog's shadow had polluted him. And he certainly wouldn't go into synagogue, and he wouldn't go into the temple in such a condition. How a far field from the love of God for sinners, Jew and non-Jew, Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There's, there's the reality. What do you have to do to start on the way to hell? According to the Scripture, be born. And yet that is like fingernails on a chalkboard to this generation. Be born. You hear people talk sometimes about an age of accountability. We came to our age of accountability when our first parents sinned. We were all accountable in Adam at that point. Here's the judgment, he says. The light has come into the world. Remember, Nicodemus came to him to say, Teacher, we know you're a man sent from God. You're prophetic at some level. The things you do, no one can do them except God is blessing what he's doing. And look what he's come to now. Here's the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Now, I don't know about you, but at this point, if I'm Nicodemus, standing in the dark of night with Jesus, I'm feeling the pressure. They won't come in the daylight. They operate in the dark. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand. Oh, we need to take this. In. Sometimes we get up the, uh, the stuff it takes to maybe encounter someone, speak to someone, engage them with a view to sharing the gospel with them and we get a, just a rejection wall put up and we take it personally. You ever done that? I mean, that's what, it happens. It happens. Don't take it personally. What you're seeing play out is you're saying, you're standing in the light saying, come on, come to the light. Come on. Come on to the light. It's okay. And they will not. They stay in the dark. Now, we tend to think that's frustrating and disappointing, and it certainly is at some level, but folks, rejoice because it means that they have some conscience to know that they are safe, in their minds are safe, in the dark, and that the light would be too exposing to them. They, they understand something about their condition. And that's why I think our task needs to be to continue to stand in the light on the edge of darkness and say, come on. I'm not going to hurt you. You're not going to be hurt. Whatever pain you have, come into the light. It can be addressed. And just keep on doing it. And sometimes simply stand, not saying a word, but in this posture of a hand extended that they know we're here. That you haven't run out of time with me. You haven't, you haven't sinned away the, grace, the day of grace with me. See, the Scripture talks about that, and sometimes we think, well, he just, he sinned away the day of grace. No, he didn't. He, not with you, he didn't. Has he got pink under the fingernail? Yes. Then invite. Invite. Because as long as there's pink under the fingernail, there's hope. It's when the heart stops beating. It's when the hope goes. We need to learn from Jesus. And take, just stand back and take an amazing gaze at how he treated this Pharisee who, who by standards knew so much and yet by gospel standards knew so little. 
And he never comes out and calls him a fool. He doesn't say he's ignorant. He doesn't say you're just absolutely wrong. He simply sets up pictures and assertions for him to lead him to the conclusion. Look what he finally says. But whoever. Here's the, here's the wonderful contrast. It doesn't end there that everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. You may have a loved one like that right now. I do. And you just simply try to invite into the light and you get this, well, I... I'm going, when I, when I can, I'm going to such and such church and, you know, and I want to ask, would they, would they know you go? Would you know the pastor's name? It's hiding in the dark. Hiding in the dark. And the temptation, I'll be honest with me, sometimes I get a little fed up and I want to say, well, stay in the dark then. Fine. But that's not, we don't want them to stay in the dark. We've experienced the light. We want them to come to the light. Because he says, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Take this picture that Jesus gives here and think through some of your encounters. Think through some of your attitudes because the truth of the matter is sometimes when we're in a bad way, when we're in sin and we're not dealing with it, we haven't confessed it and come clean and experienced the Lord's forgiveness in it, and they're letting the devil beat us over the head, we will draw back toward the shadows. We will draw away from the people of God who have the truth of God to share with us because we've stopped thinking like people saved by grace and we think like people who got in this by our good works and now somehow we've disqualified ourselves because our works are not as good as they were. <sighs> Jesus would teach us that look and live the most careless sinner you know. For a look at the Savior. We sing that hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. There's life for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Look and live. That's, when we're inviting people to come and see, come and sit down with me and drink coffee, come into my home and share a meal, really, don't we, don't we want them? See, we don't, we can't save anybody. And, and for all the pressing that I'm doing on making disciples and being disciple makers, we, can, we need to put ourselves in the way of that and commit ourselves to that. But you know, finally, only the Lord can make a disciple. That doesn't let us off the hook because he's, he said to us, the Lord who, who's the only one who can make a disciple, go into all the world and make disciples. So, but isn't that what we want finally? We want them to look and live. We want them to see who we've seen. We want them to taste and see that the Lord is good. We want the sincere milk of the word to become nourishment to them. And not be looked at them as, as if it's poison, as if somehow it's going to hurt them or kill them, ruin them. You see, come and see is, is the commitment to bring people into the sphere, whether that's in close proximity to walk alongside you, whether it's in the gathering of the people of God, singing and praising Him and, and looking at the Word together. It, it is the, the place where the Son of Man is lifted up and we pray the whole time we're talking to them, oh, look at the Savior. Don't look at me. You don't know, you know, follow me as I follow Christ, but I can't save you. And I'm a sinner. And probably the difference between me and you is I'm, I'm a forgiven sinner. You're not there yet. But look and live. Look at Jesus and live. You see, that's, that's what we need to be if not saying out loud to people initially, saying to them through our invitations to them, come and see. Come and go with me. Come, come meet people I know. You know, your transformed life, think about this, your transformed life may not do it for them. But you know what I'm willing to believe? That the mixture and combination of these lives here, somebody's going to connect with them. The transformation of somebody is going to bring light to bear. 
But folks, that'll never happen if we don't invite them. Now, they can reject us. It's okay. Don't take it personally. They may even promise you they'll come. Don't take it personally if they don't. Because it's not about us. The Bible's not about us. The Bible's about Jesus. So we need to make him all in all, the discussion, the topic. People ask you, like I told you, years ago my brother was uh, doing a part-time pastorate in College Station, Texas while he was going to Texas A&M and the Rock Prairie Baptist Church. One of his people, they were having a testimony time. One of his folks said, well, I want to share a testimony. I said, great. He said, you know, it worked this past week. Things got kind of touchy with some folks and people got upset and angry about this, that, and the other. And he said, I, I didn't let it bother me. And someone came to me and they said, tell me, so-and-so, you're different from everybody here. People get upset and they get all worked up, out of shape, and you... It doesn't seem like anything bothers you. You seem to always have an even keel. You seem to always have a glad spirit. Why, why is that? All right, now, now you're waiting with bated breath. Right? Here, here it is. His answer was, he said, here's what I told him. Now, my brother, the young collegiate pastor, is going, man, that's a softball. He's pitched you a softball, slamming it out of the park. And I told him, I just mind my own business. You can hear the door slamming on that, can't you? Opportunities to say to people, you know what? You know, I used to have the kind of disposition you're talking about, or, or there still dwells in me that disposition that if I, if, I don't, if I don't have it coated with the grace of God and if the Spirit is not leading me, then I, uh, I shudder to think what might get out, what might come out. You see, what an opportunity he had. Brothers and sisters, we have those opportunities. So live in front of people. That they'll ask you, as Peter said, always, always be ready to give reason, give an answer to every man for the reason of the hope that is in you. Why do you act hopeful when all this nonsense is going on around us? Why aren't you wringing your hands? The country's going to hell in the handbasket. Yeah, a lot of that's true. It's not the end of the story, though. I've read the end of the story. It's a great end. You need to read it. I mean, I need to show you to tell you about it. We're going to leave in a few minutes. But I want you to go sensitive ears, a discerning tongue, willing to ask the questions. And if you don't know the question to ask, I'm telling you the great the great conversation starter or conversation ender is what do you think of Jesus? A lot of people have a lot of ideas about Jesus. What do you think of Jesus? That'll either clear the room or it'll open up an opportunity to hear where somebody is when it comes to... Don't ask them what they think of Baptists. Whew. Or others. I just happen to be a Baptist. That's why I'm pretty tenacious about that. Well, bow your heads.